a visitor from Brazil? We do. We have Dr. Matheus Reguinato here. Hi, Matheus. Good morning. Bom dia. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning, DP. Professor Q. Good, good morning, Matheus. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. What time is in Brazil? Like, uh, it's like, 8 a.m. Hey, oh, perfect, perfect. Okay, so it's, it's good. All right, well, you and uh, you and uh, JP take it away. I think we have a couple of cases to present, so go for it. Yeah, yeah. JP, take it away. I just want to introduce Mateus. Uh, so Mateus Higinato is, uh, first of all, a very, very good friend of us, uh, somebody that uh, we work together, we train together by, by Evandro de Oliveira in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Mateus uh, is Brazilian like myself, has continued the work with Dr. Evandro in Sao Paulo. He currently leads the Institute of Neurological Sciences in Sao Paulo, uh, following the steps of Dr. Oliveira. He is one of the directors of the Scobase Lab uh, in the Neurosurgical Laboratory at the Hospital Beneficencia Portuguesa in Sao Paulo, and uh, uh, leads the Scobase uh, Surgery Division at uh, the Hospital uh, do Servidor Público Estadual in Sao Paulo as well. Uh, fantastic training, fantastic surgeon, and more importantly, so amazing person, who also is one of our faculty here at the Rotom de Oliveira School Base course. And uh, today is going to show, uh, you know, a very beautiful case to, to all of us, for sure. Thanks, Mateus. And, uh, at, and at a personal level, he is just an absolute pleasure to have, to learn from, to interact with, and uh, more importantly, to see as part of our family. So thank you, uh, JP, and thank you, Mateus, for everything thank that you, you do on behalf of the world, honestly, on behalf of the world, because I, I have watched you guys in the laboratory, I have watched you guys personally at meetings and social media and every media where you do matters. So thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, my friend, JP. It's an honor for me to stay with you and to be, be part of the team. It's an honor for me. I will share my screen. No. And I just want to share. I just want to say, in honor of Gabriel, this is a Colombian brew this morning. Colombian. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Let's let just a moment. Where am I? Here. You had something right there. I think that we were beginning to see some sort of PowerPoint, but I wasn't sure. Oh yeah, there you go. There you go. It's a key keynote. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the problem is reproducing. Hey, no, it's right there. Yeah, no, yeah. I need to uh, do reproduction. Okay. There you go. My there case today is from a female from 19 years old from Brazil, May 13 of 21. She had a history of a sudden headache followed by a diplopia. She had no past medical or surgical history. The physical exam is normal. The only problem is a palsy of the sixth cranial nerve on the right side. She was uh, uh, referred to another hostel. They take care of her, stay six days in the hostel and discharge her. Uh, in July 31, she had a new onset of a headache and worsening again of the diplopia. She's getting better and then worse again. This is the video with the six cranial nerve palsy. Okay. On that time, she made uh, some images that I have the images here. And to discuss these images, I will introduce Dr. Cristiane Campos, one of the best neurologists in Brazil that you work together. Tora Cristiani, she could discuss the images better with us. Hello, good morning for everyone. It's a big pleasure to be here. Dr. João Paulo, it's a great pleasure to see you here also. Dr. Mateus, thank you so much for the invitation. And I'm very happy to be here with all of you. Well, the first, the first uh, uh, CT that the patient did, uh, we can see a small round lesion, uh, high, uh, um, with hyper, hyperdensity in the right part of the bulb. And we can see in more details this lesion with uh, MRI in T1 sequence. And we can see also a high uh, T1 signal 
in the lateral part, uh, the right side of the bulb. And uh, we can see also different kinds of hyperintensity on T2. That means the, that this lesion has uh, bleeding recently. And uh, also you can see a small level, liquid liquid, and the, the last image on the right side, then we can uh, confirm this uh, hemorrhage. And so this, is, this was the first MRI that she did. And uh, we can uh, put the next slide, please, Dr. Mateus. Okay, so this is the next one. Uh, we can see the same lesion, the same shape, a little bit smaller and the right uh, part of the bulb. And you can see also a small ring, uh, in peripheral ring with hyperintensity. That means that the bleeding is a chronic stage. So we can call a hemocid ring. And you can see inside the lesion, the, uh, the hyperintensity, that means the bleeding that occurred recently. Uh, we saw in the upper <laughs> down part of the, the slide, we see the uh, sequence T1 with the gado, and we can uh, see a small DVA closer in the middle part of the lesion that we will see uh, better in the next uh, image. The such a part, the same aspect. So this is the T1 with gado, and we can see is, is exactly the DVA that is very, I would say, large. So we can. Uh, try to protect this lesion, this image, because it's only an uh, anomaly, so we cannot uh, say uh, touch. So it's very important so for the neuroradiologists to try to find this uh, lesion, because otherwise we can uh, become a problem with the venous veinage. Okay, the next slide, please. Okay, so this is the next uh, MRI uh, come a couple of months ago. I'm not sure about the, the right time, the date, but anyway, we see the lesion. It, it, it means mainly uh, hypointensity in great part of your extension. That means we can see uh, most of the part with hemosiderin and the hyperintensity part in the center of the lesion is smaller than before. It means that the bleeding has uh, absorbed or uh, regressed a little bit, uh, a great part of them. Let, next slide, please. The Fiesta sequence is very, very important for us and the radiologists to can uh, give some information about the relationship between the lesion and the corneal nerves. And you can see the lesion is very close to the sixth nerve uh, on the right side, as Dr. Mateo said, this patient developed a six part, a six nerve palsy in the beginning, uh, because this nerve is very, very uh, close to the lesion. And uh, we have an exotic part of the lesion that is in almost, uh, is always in contact with this uh, topography. So we see the axo, uh, uh, image and the sagittal image. Next slide. Okay, so we see here the same uh, lesion with the contrast. We can see also the DVA in the middle part of the, the lesion. The coronal view is very clear, exactly. And uh, in the down, yes, exactly, Dr. Mateus. We say in the center of the palms, you can show also in the middle of the slide, we saw the caput medusa that is very characteristic of this lesion. So uh, this can, uh, in this way, uh, show very clearly that we, we have a small uh, 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 DVA that is very important to, to be uh, respected. Next, next slide. Thank you, Chris. Now show the case and then we discuss the puzzle. Okay, we have a case, let me re return. With uh, such a young girl with the second uh, episode of bleeding and uh, deficit. Uh, it's an important deficit, the six nerve palsy, that he bleeds, have a, a partial recover, bleeds again and, and worsening again. When you have a cavernoma with the second episode with deficits, you have to think if it's possible to remove the lesion. Uh, you know that uh, surgical removal is the best choice for these cases. Then if in the brainstem, I think if the lesion is accessible, the lesion is resecable, and how the patient could be after the surgery. 
this lesion is accessible for me yes i will show how i think it recyclable i think yes and i think she could recover because i i really think that the the nerve the the all the the structures of the six nerves still intact okay then you have to start to think about the anatomy it's a frontal view of the brain stain our lesion is just here in the upper part of the medulla oblongata and the pons okay we saw fifth nerve seven and eight six nerve we saw the close relation of the six nerve our lesion is here huh? This is the olivary, the lower cranial nerves, the 12 nerve, the pre olivary sulcus. Have to understand the anatomy and start to think about the safest entry zones. We know that in the lateral pons, you have like a triangle that's a little safer to enter in, in this region. Okay? We have to understand, look into this anatomy, where the structures, where the tracks should be. Yeah, especially the cortical spinal tract that is most anterior. Okay, how it runs in the pons and the medulla oblongata, the, the, uh, uh, all the other tracts. We know that in the pons, we have the transverse pontine fibers and the cortical spinal tract is a little not so uh, uh, aggrupated, but when it gets lower to the medulla oblongata, the, the cortical spinal tract stays more in the midline, lateral to the uh, medial to the sixth nerve uh, way out from the, 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 this region, the pons medullary junction. Okay, our lesion is here. I need to come from this lateral view to deal with this lesion from the lateral to the cortical spinal tract that is intact. The patient has no depths. Okay, I need to come more up here where the lesion should be located. And how I think you approach this lesion. This is a good uh, paper about uh, from Spetzler that we see in green, the space you can reach with the far lateral approach. In blue with the retro sigma, light blue, the retro sig approach. And, 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 and here with the, the uh, posterior petrosal approach. Our lesion is just here, okay, just here. I need to, what I think to do a far lateral approach. What is the far lateral approach? Is a retro sigmoid approach, depending how the higher of the approach, depending of the pathology, uh, with resection at least half of the, the C1 lamina and deal with the condyle. Because of our lesion is a little higher, I will do this far lateral approach and extend a little up here to can see the, the, the lesion from this view, from down to up. And I need to drill the condyle because I, I need to take off this, uh, this margin, this corner here. I need to make it flat here to can approach the, all the, mus the muscles of this region external cladomastoid, the trapezius, the splenius, semispinalis. And you see that all these superficial muscles, here the semispinalis and longissimus, longissimus capitis, is attached to the uh, uh, superior occipital line. Okay, then deep to this, you have a fat plane. I go straight with, I, I reflect all these muscles together until you reach the fat plane. And then we deal with the deep muscles, muscle layers, okay? That's attached to the inferior nucal line, okay? We have this hetocapitis posterior minor attached to C1, inferior nucal line C1, hetocapitis major attached to C2, inferior oblique from C2 to lateral process of C1, and the uh, oblique superior, okay? This is the Suboccipital triangle that you find the vertebra in the middle, you can see the surgery at the same. Hetocapsus posterior minor, major, inferior oblique, and superior oblique. Okay. Then this region have to retract the muscles, superior oblique, inferior oblique, hetocapsus posterior major and minor to expose this region and perform the craniotomy. Here, 
C1, C2, all the muscles retracted. Okay, the other line, the, the, the midline is protected. All the other muscles is, is still attached. And then when I close the patient, I suture these muscles back and all the superficial layer too. Okay, and then expose the vertebral and made the craniotomy. Okay, let's see how it works in this surgery. Again, same sitting position, our lesion. I already discussed the, where it to be. I, I, I'm planning to see in the surgery some bulging parts of this region with probably more uh, yellow color because of the bleedings. Okay, again, the lesion just in the transition of the pons of the medulla oblongata. And this DVA that Christian already discussed with us, that's really important. When I dissect my lesion from this lateral view, I try to see this DVA in the deep part to protect it. I need to leave this DVA in place. Okay, now C1, half of C1 opening. I'm drilling the condyle because I need this corner. You see? When I open the dura, that I, I will do all my surgery looking in this direction. Okay, I'm drilling the condyle, gentle, retracting the dura with my, my suction. Okay, protecting more vertebral that is, is pulsing here. I don't need to expose all my vertebral just to see where the vertebral is to protect the vertebral from my, my drilling and my dissection. Okay. Continue opening this space, this corner that the, the condyle is. Okay, now I open the dura. Okay, you see my condyle should be here. I drill it to make this part flat. Okay, this is the cisterna magna that I'm opening. And I always like drill the, the CSF and continue opening to the top, and here we start to see the roots of the 11 nerve. We see more anterior. Uh, uh, this is the olivary. This is the 12 nerve, okay? This is nine and 10. Oops, sorry. Let's return. Okay, to do this, the surgery in sitting position is good because you, your field stay cleaning. You see here the nine, 10 and 11 with these roots. Okay, this is the 12 going uh, out more anterior to the pre olivary sulcus. And here is pica. Okay, we start to see this more yellow and bulging parts of the transition. Okay, and here is seven and eight. Open the arachnoid. Gently see, look what I'm looking now, the six nerve, because I know I need to enter lateral to the six. Look my six here. Okay, I found the six nerve. I know that my motor, uh, uh, car, uh, my motor root to be, uh, fibers will be medial to the six. I need to enter laterally. Okay, this is this will be my look the six. Okay. Now I'm going to the place you see here. It's normal. Here is normal, and here we saw the uh, uh, emosiderin. Now I found my cavernous malformation and go with the sharp dissection. I never use the bipolar here. Okay, and start dissecting. See that I'm, I'm having a plane under the nine and 10 and 11 and on the top of these fibers. I use a huge magnification in the microscope and go dissecting, looking for my DVA that should be more anterior here. Then I go around the, the, the cavernous malformation and take it out. Look my DVA. Just where I, I, I need to, I, I'm, 
I look to it. No, I, I already studied the MRI and look to it. And this is my final view. Okay, you can see here the window that I use. I could go from the top of it, from the 9, 10, and 11, between the, the uh, 7 and 8. But I made my craniotomy. I drew my condyle that should be here to open this space. And see in this patient what's the best anatomy and that's the best window that I have and in this case it was this window here you see that I'm not uh, uh, damaging the cerebellum why because I open widely the arachnoid and my uh, my spatula is just suspending it just enlarging my space but not any uh, uh, contusion in the cerebellum. Okay, now Christian will discuss the images later, but you can see the DVA, the medusas here, and the resection of the lesion. Okay, Chris, could you return? Yes. So uh, we have uh, the upper part of the slide, we have the MRI, MRI post surgery. We can see the surgical cavity in inside the medulla oblonga, uh, and we we can check, we can confirm uh, the radical excision of the cavernoma. We keep, uh, we see only the DVA that is uh, is the, has the same shape as before the surgery. And we can see only the MOCD ring uh, around the lesion where the lesion stayed before. So uh, we can conclude that we got a total excision of the cavernoma. So uh, only the DVA was uh, keeping inside, keeping the same local. Thank you. In the patient, four months after the surgery, with complete uh, recover of the six nerve. Policy. Okay, is it? I want to thank again the Mayo team, especially Professor Kio and JP, and all this great simulation center with this beautiful lab. One of our live courses in, in this great lab of Mayo Clinic. And again, using the words of William Mayo, there is no excuse today to learn the patient. To deal with this complex lesion, you need to study a lot in the lab. You have a beautiful lab in Mayo. You have this beautiful and great lab, Professor de Oliveira lab. And you have to see a lot of masters doing surgery. I have a great honor and pleasure to live very close to Professor de Oliveira since 2012. I saw a lot of masters, but this is he is my great mentor. I want to thank you all. Any questions? Beautiful um, work, Mateus. Uh, JP, take it away for some questions. Absolutely. Well, Mateus, amazing work. I mean, I wish I could say that I was surprised, but I knew that you're going to present an amazing case already. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much. But uh, OK, so, so let's have here some questions. Maybe, maybe I'll start, Mateus, as, as the questions will come by. Um, so you, as you were showing there, like uh, this lesion that you presented, this carbon was right at the transition, right? At the vitibrum, yeah. uh, at the pontomedullary medullary junction. And uh, you found this beautiful corridor going from up, uh, from down up between uh, 10 yeah, and 11. But uh, I wonder uh, your impression, because looking at some of those images as well, one could argue, well, I could get like an extended retro sig and go from up down and get a similar corridor because of this, the, this external extension that the lesion appears to have. Uh, and I just wanted your impression about that as well. I think, JP, you should go retro sig too, you know, but uh, you have to retract much more the cerebellum. So coming from down to up, you see that I, I just, I made just a small retraction from the cerebellum and mm -hmm. found this, this good option. We use, you know, our school GP. We think it's better to do a bigger approach and 
find the right way. It should be. I, I, I could make this approach and go more from, more retro sig if I need. Mm -hmm. The problem is if you do only a retro sig and you see that you don't have correct space, then say no, no, now I need to go down. And then have mm -hmm. to, you know, put the door again and drill more. I think it's better, you know, you do a lot of parlateral approach, you don't spend much, uh, much more time to do it. But I think yeah. it's better. It's like the pretemporal to, to go to the uh, intra uh, pedicular system to basilar tip analysis. You can go straight transhuman, but if you if you need more space, it's better to already prepare for it and, yeah. and uh, walk around, then go straight at the sea and say, I don't have correct space. Let me do more. Yeah, I no, think I think that uh... I stand that retro sig. I do. I do more. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I wanted. I wanted to you know for everybody to listen from you because I I fully agree with that. Um, it, it's just like uh, I think it's just going back to the topic of a surgical strategy in thinking ahead and having the plan ahead, and I think that you illustrated that very very well, Doctor Quinones always uh, shares that that uh, piece of knowledge with us as well. It's kind of like going to war and you have to be prepared to everything, kind of like unlocking the bombs and throwing them away. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's what you did uh, beautifully well, uh, you know, in this case. Um, I like to yeah, open, I, I see that. A... Dr. Q, sorry. Yeah, I was just gonna ask, maybe just go systematically. One of the things that a number of years ago as I was doing some courses with Mike Lawton and I, we went at a, in the 2014, actually, we were at a course and uh, Nader was there and he was just, fin Nader Sana, he was just finishing a, a uh, fellowship with Dr. Spesso. He says, oh, we don't use a hockey stick incision anymore. We use a linear incision in that region right here. And you do have to use a navigation because it's much easier to get lost and you have to dissect the muscles and you have to dissect them in the same direction as the muscles are positioned and so on and so forth. So Mike and I, we began to work in the cadaver, basically. And that we got ahead and, and then for the next three years, every summer, you know, we would go and do the same dissection over. By 2017, I did my first approach with the linear, with the navigation. And that's what I favor now, a small, linear incision that allows me to separate, get right in the corner of the condyle and just take one third of the condyle and then just get straight right there. And the patient seems to have an amazing recovery and the muscle is, you know, is preserved and stuff like that. Have you used that approach, Mateos or, or JP? Uh, have you uh, had any experience getting this? Because I like the, the hockey stick, I believe is, is beautiful for the anatomy, but I think at the end of the work, at the end of the day, the real window. Uh, now I do have to acknowledge that I do them in the, you know, in the uh, far lateral part bench position instead of the um, sitting position. The sitting position is absolutely beautiful the way it is because you get to see to all the anatomy. And the far lateral, everything is distorted and it gets more complex. This is why you have to use the navigation because you distort the head. So tell us about your approach and the pros and cons from your perspective. Yeah. My perspective, Professor, is like this. I think it's a good, really good option too, you know, but we don't like to turn the head to don't disturb the anatomy is one thing. Uh, and the other is we like this incision because we even don't cut any muscle. We just disinsert them, put them down, and then reinsert again. This is one advantage for me. We even don't cut any muscle, just disinsert it. And the other thing, we don't use retractors. Because of it, you can do all the surgery with the hands, uh, touching the school of the patient and using shorting instruments. Then for us, makes it more, our movements more accurate. You know, I, I, uh, this is the way I learned with Professor Jolivier and I like too much. I don't have much or any experience with these line incisions and using of the retractors because I think you stay uh, in a more longer distance from the pathology and need to use bigger instruments. But uh, I cannot uh, do bad things because I don't do this way. I am only- no, having, I agree. You know, I thought it both ways and I, I, I do agree with you. It's definitely, I mean, you can get very lost easily in the anatomy because the head is turned the anatomy, you, you move it right in the axis. 
So you yeah. can you can think that you're in the middle. C1 stays, the head rotates, the can dial is at the midline. So you really have to use navigation and and it is a little bit of stressful. I'm not gonna lie to you. The incision is smaller in the approach and um, and stuff like that, but it, it is very easily getting lost. I love the dissection that you do. You just bring me back to the original cases that I did and then I began to deviate to the linear. So you're making me rethink my approach <laughs> when I see your beautiful <laughs> exposures, you know what I mean? So anyways, good. I, mm -hmm. I think I saw someone else, JP, had a question. I'm sorry. I think you're muted, JP. Hello? Oh, uh, oh JP, go. Okay, no, somebody was about to say something. I'm sorry. No, okay. So, I mean, I, I maybe I missed the, the other question, but I'd like to take advantage that we have Dr. Vargas here. Dr. Vargas, I see some of your comments in the chat. I wonder if you'd like to share it with us. Uh, first of all, uh, great uh, exposure, uh, Dr. Uh, Mateus, a wonderful anatomy. And uh, as you said, I always remember Dr. Um, Evandro says, I like to see my instruments. Sorry, I, I turn off my other conference here. Uh, I like to see my instruments, very short uh, view and uh, short instruments in order to have good uh, maneuvers. Uh, is this very complex when you open and try to remove uh, all from that uh, incision instead of Dr. Quinones set? I don't have a good experience because I, it's, it's impossible to have a lot of volume during these surgeries. I wondered just one question. How important for this surgery is uh, monitoring and uh, how safe you can, for example, uh, monitoring the sixth nerve or the third nerve on your experience? Because we are not uh, confident so on try to put all of this uh, 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 electrodes inside the glove uh, that the people show. So, I, I, just anatomy, or you use uh, monitoring for this kind of cases? No, I use, for sure I use monitoring. I all the cases I use monitoring in this this brainstem area. Uh, I never have a problem putting the electrodes in the eye. I know that is not comfortable, but you know, uh, today I use a lot of anatomy, but I need to see the functional, <laughs> you know, the, the functional and, uh, system is and working. No, and you, and you uh, who put the electrodes on the eye? In, no, the in, in, neurophysiologist, in okay. she put it for me, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, she's really, she's a neurologist that knows a lot to discuss all the cases before, but she make all the monitorization, I, I trust on her. If I can give a, a tip like about that, because that's an important topic. Like I, I had uh, some challenges when I was starting to monitor the six in endoscopic. But uh, if you feel that you need to do that, one way that to me, uh, it's kind of like the safest is we can use one of the blue sheet cap protectors and then you protect the orbit. And then with the six, you just go in the lateral orbital ring, you palpate in the bone and go directly there. Since you're going to be deviating from uh, kind of like the, the other muscles that should go take you directly to the rectus lateralis and uh, quite often allows you to have good monitoring. The problem is if you want to do six and third together, then you're going to have, um, you know, uh, just like fifth and seven when you're monitoring. But if you're monitoring only the six, it's it's usually, you know, pretty, pretty reliable in our opinion. Very good. Okay, I'd Thank like to see if, 